Voi you, the charismatic renewal, have received a great gift from the Lord. Your movement's birth was willed by the Holy Spirit to be a current of grace in the Church and for the Church. This is your identity, to be a current of grace. It was then that Cardinal Suenens got to know the charismatic renewal, which he described as a flow of grace, and was the key person to maintaining it in the Church. In the homily of that very Mass, the Cardinal said, May the charismatic renewal disappear as such and be transformed into a Pentecostal grace for the whole Church. To be faithful to its origin, the river must lose itself in the ocean. The river must be lost in the ocean. Yes, if the river comes to a halt, the water becomes stagnant. Should the renewal, this current of grace, not end in the ocean of God, in the love of God, it would work for itself. And this is not of Jesus Christ. This is of the evil one, of the father of lies. The renewal comes from God and goes to God. Pope Paul VI blessed this. The Cardinal continues saying, the first error that must be avoided is including the charismatic renewal in the category of a movement. It is not a specific movement. The renewal is not a movement in the common sociological sense, does not have founders. It is not homogeneous, and it includes a great variety of realities. It is a current of grace, a renewing breath of the Holy Spirit for all members of the Church, laity, religious, priests and bishops. It is a challenge for us all. This current of grace passes through all Christian confessions, all of us who believe in Christ. Fifty years of Catholic charismatic renewal, a current of grace of the Spirit. And why a current of grace? Because it has neither a founder, nor statutes, nor organs of governance. Clearly, in this current, multiple expressions have been born that are certainly human works inspired by the Spirit, with various charisms, and all in the service of the Church. Thank you so much for your welcome. Someone must have told today's organizers that I really like this hymn, Jesus the Lord lives. When I would celebrate Mass in the cathedral in Buenos Aires with the charismatic renewal, after the consecration and after a few moments of adoration in tongues, 
we would sing this hymn with great joy and fervor, as you have today. Thank you. I felt at home. Praise is the breath which gives us life because it is intimacy with God, an intimacy that grows through daily praise. Some time ago I heard an example of this which seems very appropriate. The way that people breathe. Breathing is made up of two stages. Inhaling the intake of air and exhaling the letting out of this air. The spiritual life is fed, nourished by prayer and is expressed outwardly through mission. Inhaling prayer and then exhaling. When we inhale by prayer, we receive the fresh air of the Holy Spirit. When exhaling this air, we announce Jesus Christ risen by the same Spirit. No one can live without breathing. It is the same for the Christian. Without praise and mission, there is no Christian life. Praise, adoration are needed. When speaking of adoration, little is said. What do we do when praying? We ask something from God, we thank Him, we intercede. But adoration, adoring God, is part of a Christian's breathing, praise and adoration. The charismatic renewal has reminded the Church of the necessity and importance of the prayer of praise. When we speak of the prayer of praise in the Church, charismatics come to mind. When I spoke of the prayer of praise during a homily at Mass in Santa Martha, I said it is not only the prayer of charismatics, but of the entire Church. It is the recognition of the Lordship of God over us and over all creation, expressed through dance, music, and song. I would like to revisit with you a few passages from that homily. The prayer of praise is a Christian prayer for all of us. In the Mass, every day, when we sing the Holy, 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 this is a prayer of praise. We praise God for His greatness because He is great. And we address Him with beautiful words because it pleases us to do this. The prayer of praise bears fruit in us. Sarah danced as she celebrated her fertility at the age of 90. This fruitfulness gives praise to God. Men and women who praise the Lord, who pray praising the Lord, and who are happy to do so, rejoice in singing the Sanctus at Mass, and they bear fruit. Let us consider how beautiful it is to offer the prayer of praise to God. This should be our prayer, and as we offer it up to the Lord, we ought to say to ourselves, Arise, O heart, because you are standing before the King of glory. Praise the Lord at all times. Never cease to do so. Praise Him more and more, unceasingly. I have been told of charismatic prayer groups in which they pray the rosary. Prayer to the Mother of God must never be excluded, never. But when you assemble for prayer, praise the Lord. Together with this experience, you continually remind the Church of the power of prayer and praise. Praise, which is the prayer of acknowledgement and thanksgiving for the gratuitous love of God. It may be that not everyone likes this form of prayer, 
but it is certainly fully integrated in the biblical tradition. The Psalms, for example. David, who danced before the Ark of the Covenant, full of jubilation. And please, let us not fall into the trap of the attitude of Christians with the Michael complex. Named after she who was ashamed of how David praised God. Jubilation, cheerfulness, joy, fruit of the same action of the Holy Spirit. Either the Christian experiences joy in his or her heart, or there is something wrong. The joy of the announcement of the good news of the gospel. I expect you to share with everyone in the Church the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit, a phrase we find in the Acts of the Apostles. Be dispensers of the grace of God. I can see from the program where the names of the communities are mentioned that at the introduction you have inserted the phrase to share the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the whole Church. The Church needs the Holy Spirit. How could it be otherwise? Every Christian in his or her life requires a heart open to the sanctifying action of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit promised by the Father is He who reveals Jesus Christ to us, who gives us the possibility of saying, Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot say this. He reveals Jesus Christ to us. He leads us to a personal encounter with Him and in so doing, changes our life. A question for you. Is this your experience? Share it with others. In order to share this experience, you must live it and witness to it. And grace cannot be bought. It is free. It is grace. And while speaking about dispensers of grace, I ask you, each and every one, that as partakers of this current of grace of the charismatic renewal, to please organize Life in the Spirit seminars in your parishes, seminaries, schools, neighborhoods, so that you may share with all the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What is the common sign of those who are reborn of this current of grace? To become new men and women, this is baptism in the Spirit. I ask you to read John 3, verses 7 and 8. Jesus to Nicodemus, rebirth in the Spirit. I ask you for your important contribution, especially to undertake to share with all in the Church the baptism you have received. You have lived this experience. Share it in the Church. 
And this is the most important service, the most important that can be given to everyone in the Church, to help the people of God in their personal encounter with Jesus Christ, who changes us into new men and women, in little groups, humble but effective, because it is the Spirit at work. The charismatic renewal is a great force meant to serve the preaching of the gospel in the joy of the Holy Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit and He has made you appreciate God's love for all His children. He has also made you love God's Word. In the early days, they used to say that you, charismatics, always carried around a Bible, the New Testament. Do you still carry one today? Yes. I am not so sure. If not, return to this first love and always carry the Word of God in your packet or bag and read a bit of it. Keep the Word of God with you always. I expect you to evangelize with the Word of God, which proclaims that Jesus lives and that He loves all men and women. Be close to the poor and to those in need, so as to touch in their flesh the wounded flesh of Jesus. Please, draw near to them. Go out into the streets and evangelize. Proclaim the gospel. Remember that the church was born on the move that Pentecost morning. Unity in the working together for the poor and the needy, who are also in need of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It would be so beautiful to organize seminars of life in the Spirit, together with other Christian charismatic realities for brothers and sisters who live on the streets. They too have the Spirit within who impels them, so that someone will open wide the door from the outside. I like very much to think of Philip when the angel said to him, Go on the road to Gaza and find the proselyte, minister of economy of the Queen of Ethiopia, Candace. He was a proselyte and was reading Isaiah. And Philip explained the word to him proclaimed Jesus, and the man was converted. And at a certain point he said, but here there is water, I want to be baptized. It was the Spirit that drove Philip to go there. And from the beginning it was the Spirit that drove all believers to proclaim the Lord. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, praise, service to man, the three things are indissolubly joined. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, praise, the prayer of praise, service to man, they are joined. I can praise profoundly, but if I do not help those most in need, it is not enough. There was not a needy person among them, 
said the book of Acts. We will not be judged for our praise, but for how much we have done for Jesus. But Lord, when did we do this for you? Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of one of these my brothers, you did it to me. As in an orchestra, no one in the renewal can think of himself or herself as being more important or greater than the others. Please. Because when you think of yourselves as more important or greater, disaster is already on the horizon. No one can say, I am the head. Like the church, you have only one head, one Lord, the Lord Jesus. Repeat with me, who is the head of the renewal? The Lord Jesus. Who is the head of the renewal? The Lord Jesus. And we can say this with the power given us by the Holy Spirit, since no one can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. You, the people of God, the people of the charismatic renewal must be careful not to lose the freedom which the Holy Spirit has given you. The danger for the renewal, as our dear Padre Raniero Cantalamesa often says, is that of getting too organized the danger of excessive planning. Yes, you need organization, but never lose the grace of letting God be God. Another danger is that of becoming arbiters of God's grace. Many times, leaders, I prefer the name servants of a group or community become, perhaps without intending to, managers of grace deciding who can receive the prayer of outpouring of baptism in the Spirit and who cannot. If any of you are doing this, I ask you to stop. No more. You are dispensers of God's grace, not its arbiters. Don't act like a tall house for the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, there is a great temptation for the leaders. And this temptation for the servants comes from the devil. The temptation to believe they are indispensable, no matter what the task is. The devil leads them to believe they are the ones in command, who are at the center. 
And thus, step by step, they slip into authoritarianism, into personalism, and do not let the renewed communities live in the spirit. This temptation is such as to make eternal the position of those who consider themselves irreplaceable, a position that always has some form of power or dominance over others. This is clear to us. The only replaceable one in the Church is the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the only Lord. There must be a limited term of office for post, which in reality are services. An important service of the leaders, of lay leaders, is to make those who will fill their post at the end of their service grow and mature spiritually and pastorally. It is appropriate that every service in the Church has an expiry date. There are no lifelong leaders in the Church. This happens in some countries where there is dictatorship. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, says Jesus. This temptation, which is from the devil, makes one go from servant to master. One dominates that community, that group. This temptation also makes one slide into vanity. And power leads us. Excuse me but I will say it. Excuse me, but I will say it. How many leaders become vain peacocks? Power leads to vanity, and then one feels one can do anything. And then one slides into business dealings because the devil always enters through the wallet. This is the devil's way in. Do not look so much at having large gatherings which often end there, but to homemade relationships which stem from witness in the family at work, in social life, in parishes, prayer groups, with all, with all. And here I ask you to take the initiative to create bonds of trust and cooperation with the bishops who have the pastoral responsibility to guide the body of Christ, including Charismatic Renewal. When I think of charismatics, I think of the Church herself, but in a particular way. I think of a great orchestra where all the instruments and voices are different from one another, yet all are needed to create the harmony of the music. Seek unity in the renewal. 
because unity comes from the Holy Spirit and is born of the unity of the Trinity. Who is the source of division? The devil. Division comes from the devil. Flee from all in fights, please. Let there be none of this among you. The first is unity in diversity. Uniformity is not Catholic. It is not Christian. Rather, unity in diversity. Catholic unity is different, but it is one. This is curious. The cause of diversity. It is also the cause of unity, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does two things. He creates unity in diversity. Unity does not imply uniformity. It does not necessarily mean doing everything together or thinking in the same way, nor does it signify a loss of identity. Unity in diversity is actually the opposite. It involves the joyful recognition and acceptance of the various gifts which the Holy Spirit gives to each one and the placing of these gifts at the service of all members of the Church. Last year, in the stadium, I also spoke of unity in diversity. I gave the example of an orchestra. In Evangelii Gaudium, I spoke of the sphere and the polyhedron. It is not enough to speak of unity. It is not any sort of unity. It is not uniformity. Said thus, it can be understood as the unity of a sphere, where every point is equidistant from the center and there are no differences between one point and another. The model is the polyhedron, which reflects the confluence of all the parts which maintain their originality in it. And these are the charisms in unity, but in their own diversity. Unity in diversity. The distinction is important because we are speaking of the work of the Holy Spirit, not our own. Unity in the diversity of expression of reality, as many as the Holy Spirit wills to arouse. It is also necessary to remember that the whole Namely, this unity is greater than the part, and the part cannot attribute the whole to itself. For instance, one cannot say, we are the current called the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and you are not. This cannot be said. Please, brothers, this is how it is. It does not come from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit blows where He wills, when He wills, and as He wills. Unity in diversity and in truth, that is Jesus Himself. Do not forget that the charismatic renewal is, by its very nature, ecumenical.
Blessed Paul VI commented on this in the magnificent apostolic exhortation on evangelization, which is highly relevant in our day. The power of evangelization will find itself considerably diminished if those who proclaim the gospel are divided among themselves in all sorts of ways. Is this not perhaps one of the great sicknesses of evangelization today? Yes, the destiny of evangelization is certainly bound up with the witness of unity given by the Church. This is a source of responsibility and also of comfort. These words are of Blessed Paul VI. Spiritual ecumenism is praying and proclaiming together that Jesus is Lord and coming together to help the poor in all their poverty. This must be done. While never forgetting in our day that the blood of Jesus put out by many Christian martyrs in various parts of the world, calls us and compels us towards the goal of unity. For persecutors, we are not divided. We are not Lutherans, Orthodox, Evangelicals, Catholics. No, we are one in their eyes. For persecutors, we are Christians. They are not interested in anything else. This is the ecumenism of blood that we experience today. There is a problem which is a scandal. It is a scandal. It is the problem of the division among Christians. It is the problem of the division among Christians. Ecumenism is not just another thing to do. It is a command of Jesus, a command he expressed at the moment before being delivered up to death. Father, may all be one as you and I are one, so that the world may believe that it is you who have sent me. Ecumenism is not just a task. It is seeking the unity of the body of Christ broken by our sins of division. It is our task, now that there is an ecumenical conscience, that Jesus, through his Spirit, gives us the grace to discover this way. He invites us to seek the unity of the body of Christ, seeking it first of all within our hearts. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The spiritual ecumenism must penetrate our shepherd's heart. This is the ecumenism of blood that we are living now. It is the mingled blood of our martyrs. There is a confession from the devil. They are Christians. They must be exterminated. You, Charismatics, have a special grace to pray and work for Christian unity. For the current of grace passes through all Christian churches. Christian unity is the work of the Holy Spirit, and we must pray together. Spiritual ecumenism, the ecumenism of prayer. But Father, can I pray with an evangelical, with an orthodox, with a Lutheran? You must, you must. You have received the same baptism. We have all received the same baptism. We are all going on Jesus' path. We want Jesus.
We have all made these divisions in history, for so many reasons, but not good, not good ones. But now, in fact, it is time in which the Spirit makes us think that these divisions are not good, that these divisions are a counter-testimony, and we must do everything in order to journey together. Spiritual ecumenism, the ecumenism of prayer, the ecumenism of work, but of charity at the same time, the ecumenism of reading the Bible together, to go together towards unity. But Father, do we have to sign a document? For this, let yourself be carried forward by the Holy Spirit. Pray, work, love, and then the Spirit will do the rest. And this is something that I entrust to you. Perhaps I have already told you this, but it is a true story. It is a true story. In Hamburg, a city of Germany, there was a parish priest who studied the writings to carry forward the cause for the beatification of a priest killed by Nazis. Guillotined. The reason he taught children the catechism. And as he studied, he discovered that after the priest, five minutes later, a Lutheran pastor was guillotined for the same reason. And the blood of both was mixed. Both were martyrs. Both were martyrs. It is the ecumenism of blood. If the enemy unites us in death, who are we to be divided in lie? Let us allow the Spirit to enter. Let us pray to go forward all together. But there are differences. Let us leave them aside. Let us walk with what we have in common, which is enough. There is the Holy Trinity, there is baptism. Let us go forward in the strength of the Holy Spirit. A few months ago, there were those 23 Egyptians who were also beheaded on the beach in Libya, who in that moment said Jesus' name. But they are not Catholic, but they were Christians. They are brothers. They are our martyrs. The ecumenism of blood. Fifty years ago, at the canonization of the young martyrs of Uganda, Paul VI made reference to the fact that their Anglican companion catechist had also put out their blood for the same reason. They were Christians. They were martyrs. Excuse me. Do not be scandalized. They are our martyrs because they gave their life for Christ and this is the ecumenism of blood. Today there are more martyrs than yesteryear. Today there are more martyrs. Christians. Those who kill Christians before killing them do not ask. Are you Orthodox? Are you Catholic? Are you Evangelical? Are you Lutheran? Are you Calvinist? No. Are you Christian? Yes, then your throat is cut immediately. Today there are more martyrs than in the early times. And this is the ecumenism of blood. We are united by the witness of our martyrs of today. 
In several parts of the world, Christian blood is being shed. Today, the unity of Christians is more urgent than ever, united by the work of the Holy Spirit in prayer and in action for the weakest. Walk together, work together, love each other, love each other, and together seek to explain the differences, agree, but on the path. If we stay still without walking, we will never, ever agree. This is how it is. The Holy Spirit wants us to be on the move. Peace is possible starting from our confession that Jesus is the Lord and from our evangelization on this road. It is possible. While showing that we have differences, but this is obvious, we have differences, but that we wish to be a reconciled diversity. Here we must not forget this phrase, but say it to everyone, reconciled diversity. And this phrase is not mine. It is not mine. It is from a Lutheran brother. Reconciled diversity. I thank the Catholic Fraternity and ECRIS for organizing this Golden Jubilee for this vigil. And I thank each one of the volunteers who have made this possible, many of whom are here. I am thankful in particular for the fact that the request I made to you two years ago to give the Charismatic Renewal Worldwide a single international service based here has started to take shape in the constitutive acts of this new single service. It is the first step. Others will follow. But soon unity, the work of the Holy Spirit, will be a reality. Behold, I am making all things new, says the Lord. Thank you, Catholic Charismatic Renewal, for what you have given the Church in these 50 years. The Church counts on you, on your fidelity to the Word, on your willingness to serve and your witness of lives transformed by the Holy Spirit. Share with all in the Church the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord ceaselessly. Walk together with Christians of different churches and Christian communities in prayer and in action for those most in need. Serve the poorest and the sick. This is what the Church and the Pope expect of you. Catholic Charismatic Renewal. But from all of you, all, all of you who have entered in this current of grace, thank you. Thank you.